Chapter 22 of Europe in the Middle Ages by Ierna Lifford Plunkett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 22, Part 1, The Fall of the Greek Empire. The final failure of Christendom to preserve Eastern Europe from the infidel may be traced back to the disastrous Fourth Crusade in the 13th century, when Venice, for purely selfish reasons, drove out the Greek rulers of Constantinople and helped to establish a Latin or Frankish empire. This empire lasted for 57 years, weak in its foundation and growing ever weaker like a badly built house, ready to tumble to the ground at the first tempest. It pretended to embrace all the territory that had belonged to its predecessors, but many of the feudal landowners whom it appointed were never able to take possession of their estates that remained under independent Greek or Bulgarian princes, while in Asia Minor the exiled Greek emperors ruled at Nicaea, awaiting an opportunity to cross the Bosporus and effect a triumphant return. Michael Paleologus, to whom the opportunity came, was an unscrupulous adventurer who, on account of his military reputation, had been appointed guardian of the young emperor of Nicaea, John Ducas, a boy of eight. Taking advantage of this position, Michael drove from the court all whom he knew to be disinterested partisans of his charge, and then declared himself joint emperor with the child. This ambitious claim was but a step to worse deeds, for before he was ten years old, the unhappy little emperor had been blinded and thrust into a dungeon by his co-emperor's orders, and the Paleologi had become the reigning house of the Eastern Empire. This was an evil day for Christendom, for though Michael Paleologus beat down the resistance of all the Greek princes who dared to resent the way in which he had usurped the throne, and afterwards succeeded in entering Constantinople, yet neither he nor his descendants were the type of men to preserve what he had gained. Nearly all the paleology were weak and false, Michael himself so shifty in his dealings that his friends trusted him less than his enemies. Because he had won his throne by fraud and cruelty, he was always suspicious, like Italian despots, lest one of his generals should turn against him and outwit him. Instead, therefore, of keeping his attention fixed on the steadily increasing power of the Mohammedans, an inspection that would have warned a wise man to maintain a strong army along the borders of the empire in Asia Minor, he was so afraid of his own Greek troops that, once established in Constantinople, he disbanded whole regiments and exiled their best officers. Everything he did, in fact, was calculated merely to secure his immediate safety or advantage with no thought for the future, so that he died leaving his kingdom an easy prey to foreign enemies strong enough to seize the advantage. Besides the misrule of Michael Paleologus, other factors were at work busily undermining the restored Greek empire. For one thing, the Greek and Bulgarian princes, who had obtained independence when the Latins ruled in Constantinople, had no intention of returning to their old allegiance, while here and there were feudal states, like the Duchy of Athens, established by the Latins and still held by them, although the Frankish emperor who had been their suzerain had disappeared. The islands in the Aegean Sea were most of them in Venetian hands, and Venice took care that the Greek Empire, whose fleet she had swept from the Mediterranean in the 13th century, should not construct another sufficiently strong to win back these commercial and naval bases. In the same way, the trade that had passed from Constantinople never returned, for the cities of the Mediterranean preferred to deal on their own account with Syrian and Egyptian merchants rather than to pay toll to a middleman in the markets of the Paleology. For all these reasons, it can be easily seen that the new Byzantine Empire was in a far worse state of weakness and instability than the old. Like Philip IV of France, who found the financial methods of Charlemagne quite inadequate for dealing with his more modern needs and expenses, the Paleology were confronted by a system of administering laws 
and exacting taxes that having completely broken down under the strain of foreign invasion was even more incapable of meeting fourteenth-century problems with any feasible solution more practical rulers might have invented new methods but the only hope of the upstart line that had usurped power without realizing the responsibility such power entailed was to seek the military and financial aid of the west as in the days of alexius comenus little such aid was there to gain venice and genoa once eager crusaders were now too busy contesting the supremacy of the mediterranean to act together as allies in eastern waters the popes annoyed that the overthrow of the latin empire had brought about the restoration of the greek church were willing enough to consider the reconversion of byzantium held out to them as bait but even if they granted their sympathy they had obviously too many political troubles of their own to make lavish promises likely of fulfilment western europe in fact was too interested in its own national struggles to answer calls to a crusade too blind in its narrow self-interest and prejudice against the greeks to realize what danger the ruin of constantinople must bring on those who for centuries used her as a bulwark andronicus too the son and successor of michael was equally cruel and false and still more of a personal coward he saw the dangers of a mohammedan invasion that his father had ignored and in terror both of the turks and of his own subjects arranged to hire a band of catalan mercenaries who had been fighting for the aragonese against the angevins in sicily in the war introduced by the sicilian vespers this war over the captain of the catalans roger de flor a templar who had been expelled from his order for his wild deeds was quite willing to unsheathe his sword on a new field of glory and pillage so that on receiving dazzling promises of reward and friendship he and his merry men sailed for the east once established in greece however the catalans proved so arrogant and lawless that the greeks complained that they were a far worse infliction than the mohammedans quarrels ensued and finally in the course of a bitter dispute between roger de flor and andronicus the spanish general was murdered as he stood talking to his master this act of treachery added to growing indignation at the limited supplies of money the emperor had grudgingly dispersed for his foreman army turned the catalans from pretense allies into a horde of raging enemies from the walls of constantinople itself they were driven back but elsewhere they burned and slew and laid waste the country until at last reaching athens they stormed the walls of that city killed its latin duke and established themselves as an independent republic by the time they had ceased to rove the catalans had also ceased to be dangerous but in their savage wanderings they had inflicted incalculable harm upon the byzantine empire the andronicus who could barely hold them at bay before the gates of his capital was an andronicus who could not hope to withstand invasion in asia minor and over his eastern boundaries left weakly garrison since the days of michael palaeologus poured the turks in irresistible numbers soon there remained to the greek empire of all their provinces across the bosporus merely a strip of coastline to the north of the dardanelles and finally this also was whittled away and the turks crossed the straits and captured gallipoli as a base for future operations in europe the chief mohammedan emir during this period of conquest was a certain orkham son of othman whose name in the form ottoman is still borne by his branch of the turkish race this orkan was quite as cruel and unscrupulous as the paleologi but far more statesmanlike for as he conquered the territory of greek emperors and rival emirs in asia minor he consolidated his rule over them by a just and careful government that gradually welded them into a compact state when a civil war broke out between john v the grandson of andronicus ii and his guardian and co-ruler a wily schemer of the michael paleologus type called john cantacuzanus the latter with other lack of patriotism appealed to orkin for aid 
he even offered him his daughter in marriage an alliance to which the turks eagerly agreed dispatching a large force of auxiliaries to thrace as a token of his friendly intentions toward his future father-in-law these troops he determined should remain and difficult indeed the christians found it to dislodge them in later years for the turkish legions had been stiffened by a device of orkham which has done more to keep his name in men's minds perhaps than any of his victories it was the emir's custom on a march of conquest not to oppress the conquered but to exact from them a tribute both in money and in child life from every village that passed under the rule of orkham his soldiers carried away from their homes a fixed number of young boys chosen because of their health and sturdy well-developed limbs these children were placed in barracks where they were educated without any knowledge of their former life to become soldiers of the prophet fanatical highly disciplined skilled with a bow and sabre inculcated with but one ideal and ambition to excel in statecraft or on the battlefield because of their excessive loyalty emirs would choose from among the ranks of these tribute children their viziers and other chief officials while the majority would enter the infantry corps of janissaries or new soldiers whose ferocity and endurance in attacking or holding apparently impossible positions became the terror of europe in the words of a modern historian quote, with diabolical ingenuity the turks secured the victory of the crescent by the children of the cross and trained up christian boys to destroy the independence and authority of their country and their church in 1361 some years after orkin's death the turks captured adrianople and thus came into contact with other christian nations besides the greeks namely the serbians and hungarians the serbians were the principal slav race in the balkans and under their great ruler stephen dushan it had seemed likely that they might become the predominant power in eastern europe the kings of bulgaria and bosnia were their vassals they had made conquests both in albania and greece thus opening up a way to the adriatic and aegean seas it would have been well for christendom if this energetic race of fighters could have subdued the feeble greeks and so presented to the turks when they crossed the bosporus a foe worthy to match the janissaries in stubborn courage unfortunately stephen dushan died before the years of turkish invasion leaving his throne to a young son a youth of great parts as a serbian chronicler describes him quiet and gracious but without experience only experience or an iron will could have held together in those rough times a kingdom relying for its protection on the swords of a quarrelsome nobility and serbia broke up into a number of small principalities her disintegration assisted by the ambitious jealousy of louis the great of hungary who lost no opportunity of dismembering and weakening this sister kingdom that might otherwise prove a hindrance to his own imperial projects with the career of louis we have dealt in other chapters and have seen him humbling the venetians driving joanna I out of naples acquiring the throne of poland fighting against the turks and the emperor charles iv because he spent his energy recklessly in all these projects louis remains for posterity apart from the civilizing influence of his court life one of the arch destroyers of the middle ages the sovereign who more than any other exposed eastern europe to mohammedan conquest had he either refrained from his constant policy of aggression toward serbia thus allowing her to unite her subject princes in the face of the invading turks or had he even been powerful enough to found an empire of hungary that would absorb both serbia and constantinople and act as a bulwark in the east medieval history would have closed on a different scene instead the famous victories of louis over the turks that made his name honored by christendom were rendered of no avail by other partial victories over christian nations who should have been his allies on the field of kosovo in 1389 the serbians shorn of half their provinces and weakened and betrayed by the hungarians 
met the Turks in battle. Both sides have left record of the ferocity of the struggle. The angels in heaven, said the Turks, amazed by the hideous noise, forgot the heavenly hymns with which they always glorify God. The battlefield became like a tulip bed with its ruddy severed heads and rolling turbans. Few, wrote the Serbian chronicler, returned to their own country. When the day closed, both the Serbian king, Lazar, and the Turkish sultan lay dead among their warriors, and the victory, as far as the actual fighting was concerned, seemed to rest neither with Christian nor Moslem. Yet in truth, the Turk could supply other armies as numerous and as well equipped to take the place of those who had fallen, while the Serbians had exhausted their uttermost effort. Thus, the fruits of the battle fell entirely into the hands of the infidel. Things are hard for us, hard since Kosovo, is a modern Serbian saying, for the Serbs have never forgotten the day when they fought their last despairing battle as champions of the cross, and lost for a time their ambition of dominating Eastern Europe. There resteth to Serbia a glory, runs the old ballad, Yea, as long as a babe shall be born, or there resteth a man in the land, so long as a blade of corn shall be reaped by a human hand, so long as the grass shall grow on the mighty plain of Kosovo, so long, so long, even so, shall the glory of those remain who in this day in battle were slain. From the day of Kosovo, the ultimate conquest of Eastern Europe by the Turks became a certainty. Lack of ambition on the part of some of the sultans, and a life and death struggle in which others found themselves involved in Asia Minor against Tartar tribes, merely deferred the time of reckoning. But it came at last in the middle of the 15th century, when Mohammed II, the conqueror, determined to reign in Constantinople. This Mohammed, famous in medieval history, was the son of a Serbian princess, and he is said to have grown up indifferent alike to Christianity or Islam. He is described as having a pair of red and white cheeks full and round, a hooked nose, and a resolute mouth, while flatterers went still farther and declared that his mustache was like leaves over two rosebuds, and every hair of his beard a thread of gold. In character, from a fierce, undisciplined boy, he grew into a self-willed man, intent upon the satisfaction of his ambitions and desires. He could speak, or at least understand, Arabic, Greek, Persian, Hebrew, and Latin, and chroniclers record that it was in reading the triumphs of Alexander and Julius Caesar that he was first inspired with the thought of becoming a great general. His rival, Constantine XI, the last and best of the Paleologi, was a man of very different type from the Turk, or indeed from his own ancestors. He was devoted to the Christian religion and Greece, brave, simple, and generous. When he first became aware of Muhammad's aggressive hostility, he attempted to disarm it by liberating Turkish prisoners. If it shall please God to soften your heart, he sent word, I shall rejoice. But however that may be, I shall live and die in the defense of my people and of my faith. His words were put to the test when, in the autumn of 1452, the siege of Constantinople began. The emperor looked despairingly for Western aid, in order to secure which the emperor John V had himself in years gone by, visited Rome, and made formal renunciation to the Pope of all the views of the Greek Church that disagreed with Catholic doctrine. One of the chief points of controversy had been the Catholic use of unleavened bread in the sacrament of the Mass. Another, the words of the Nicene Creed, declaring that the Holy Ghost proceeded from the Son as well as from the Father. In all matters of faith, as well as of ecclesiastical jurisdiction, John V, and later Constantine himself, had made open acknowledgment of the supremacy of Rome, but their compliance did not avail to save their kingdom in the hour of danger. Indeed, while it evoked little military support from Catholic nations, 
it aroused keen hostility and treachery at home there were many greeks who refused to endorse their sovereign's signature to what they considered an act of national betrayal some declaring openly that the mohammedans victories were god's punishment on kings who had forsaken the faith of their fathers and that it would be better to see the turbans of the infidels in saint sophia than a cardinal's red hat when then Muhammad began to thunder with his fourteen batteries against the once impregnable walls of Constantinople, making enormous breaches, the reduction of the city had become only a question of days. It is said that the Sultan, in his eagerness to take possession, offered the Emperor and his army freedom and religious toleration if they would capitulate. I desire either my throne or a grave, replied Constantine, knowing well which of the two must be his fate. Besides some four thousand of his own subjects, he could command only a few hundred mercenaries sent by the Pope and three hundred Genoese. Of the Venetians and other Western Europeans there were even less, and it was with this miniature army that he manned the wide circuit of the walls, let out sorties, and rebuilt as well as he could the gaps made by the heavy guns. The contest was absurdly unequal, for Mohammed had some 258,000 men, and in May 1453 the inevitable end came to a heroic struggle. Up through the breaches in the wall that no labor was left to repair, climbed wave after wave of fanatical janissaries, shouting their hopes of victory and paradise. Beneath their continuous onslaughts the defenders weakened and broke, fighting to the last amid the narrow streets until constantine himself was slain his body only recognized later by the golden eagles embroidered on his shoes the women and many of the greeks who had refused to help in this time of crisis because of the emperor's submission to the catholic church were torn from their sanctuary in saint sophia and sold as slaves in the markets of syria Thus was lost the second city of Christendom to the infidels, and the old Roman Empire, whose restoration had been a medieval idea for centuries, perished forever. Retribution, at least according to human ideas of justice, often seems to lag in history. But in the case of the fall of Constantinople, some of the culprits most responsible, on account of their selfish indifference, were speedily called on to pay the penalty. Mohammed too, his ambition inflated by what he had already achieved, planned the reduction of Christendom, declaring that he would feed his horse from the altar of St. Peter's in Rome. With an enormous army, he advanced through Serbia and besieged Belgrade. But here he was thrust back by a Christian champion, John Hunyadi, the wicked one, as his title reads in Turkish, with such loss of men and material that Hungary and eastern Germany were saved from serious danger for eighty years. With the Balkan states it was otherwise, whose governments, divided in their councils, jealous in their rivalries, had been incapable of the union that could alone have saved them, and one by one they were crushed beneath the conqueror's heel. Greece also came under Moslem domination, and finally the islands of the Aegean Sea that Venice had torn from Constantinople in the interests of her trade were wrested away from her, leaving her faced with the prospect of commercial ruin. Part 2. Voyage and Discovery All through the Middle Ages, it had been to the cities of the Mediterranean, first of all to Amalfi and Pisa, then to Marseille, Barcelona, Genoa, and Venice, that Europe had turned as her obvious medium of communication with the East and all its fabulous wonders. In the 13th century, a Venetian merchant, Marco Polo, setting forth with his father and uncle, had visited the kingdom of Cathay, or China, and brought back, 20 years later, not only marvelous tales of the court of Kublai Khan, Pekin, but also precious stones, rubies, sapphires, diamonds, and emeralds in such abundance that he was soon nicknamed by his fellow citizens as Marco of the Millions. Into the delighted ears of the guests he invited to a banquet on his return, 
he poured descriptions of a land where merchants are so numerous and so rich that their wealth can neither be told nor believed they and their ladies do nothing with their own hands but live as delicately as if they were kings what seems to have struck his medieval mind with almost astonishment were the enormous public baths in the city of heaven in southern china of which there were four thousand the largest and most beautiful baths in the world the banquets also given by the great khan excelled any european feasts they were attended by many thousands of guests and their host raised on a dais had as his servants the chief nobles who would wind rich towels around their mouths that they might not breathe upon the royal plates for presents the khan was accustomed to receive at a time some five thousand camels or an equal number of elephants draped in silken cloths worked with silver and gold his government surpassed in its organization anything europe had imagined since the fall of the roman empire such for instance as the postal system by means of messengers on foot and horse that linked up beacon with lands a hundred days distance or the beneficent regard of a ruler who in times of bad harvests not only remitted taxation but dispatched grain to the principal districts that had suffered coal was used in china freely a kind of black stone cut from the mountains in veins as marco polo describes it it maintains the fire he added better than wood and throughout the whole of cathay this fuel is used besides dilating on the wealth and prosperity of china the venetian had also much to say of zipangu or japan of tibet and bengal of ceylon the finest island in the world and of java supposed then to be above three thousand miles wide other travellers were to confirm many of his statements but none told their tales so simply and realistically as polo while not a few like the english sir john mandeville in the fourteenth century supplied fiction in large doses where it seemed to them the truth might bore their readers the eagerness with which either fact or fiction was swallowed bears witness at any rate first to the extraordinary fascination excited in medieval minds by such names as cathay or zapangu and next to the general western belief in the inexhaustible riches of the east and their determination to secure at least a portion when the seljuk turks with their fierce animosity towards christendom had settled like a curtain between east and west the dangers and expense of trading and commerce with arabia and asia minor of course increased venice and genoa still brought back shiploads of silks spices and perfumes for western markets but the price of these goods was increased by the tolls paid to turkish sultans and emirs for leave to transfer merchandise from camels to trading sloops then came the fall of constantinople when venice by a treaty with the conqueror in the following year appeared to secure wonderful trading privileges mohammed however made such promises only to break them when convenient and so as soon as he could afford to do so because he was securely established in europe the tolls he demanded became heavier not lighter the restrictions he placed on trade more and more galling to christian merchants until the usual purchasers of venetian goods grew exasperated at prices that doubled and trebled continually there were but two methods of avoiding this ever-increasing policy of exploitation apart from doing without such luxuries either a complete conquest of the turks that would compel them to open up afresh the old caravan routes to the east or else the discovery of a new route that would avoid their dominions altogether largely through the blind selfishness of mediterranean cities and especially of venice we have seen that the golden opportunity of aiding the byzantine empire had been lost for ever thus the first method failed it remains to deal with the second the voyages of discovery with which the middle ages fittingly close toward the end of the fourteenth century there was born in portugal a prince henry third son of king john i and grandson by an english mother of john of gaunt duke of lancaster 
While he was still a boy, this prince earned fame for his share in the capture of Ceuta, a Moorish town exactly opposite Gibraltar on the North African coast. To the ordinary Portuguese mind, this conquest raised hopes of a gradual absorption of the southern Mediterranean seaboard, possibly of competition in the Levant with Genoa and Venice. But Prince Henry saw farther than ordinary minds. The problem that he set himself, and anyone, Arab or European, who seemed likely to supply a solution, was, what would happen if, instead of entering the Mediterranean, Portuguese ships were to sail due south? How big was this unknown stretch of land called Africa, in the maps of which geographers hid their ignorance by placing labels such as, here are hippographs, here are two-headed monsters? Would it not be possible to reach the far-famed wonders of Cathay by sailing first south and then east around Africa, thus avoiding trade routes through Syria and southern Russia? It was fortunate that Prince Henry was a mathematician and geographer himself, for many people told him in answer to his inquiries that Africa ended at Cape Nam, not so many miles south of Tangier, while others, that the white man who dared to sail beyond a certain point, would be turned black by the heat of the sun, while the waters boiled about his vessel and the winds blew sheets of flame across the horizon. Prince Henry refused to believe such tales. He could not sail himself, because he was so often occupied with wars in Africa against the Moors, but year after year he fitted out ships at his own expense, and chose the most daring mariners whom he could find, bribing them with promises of reward and fame to navigate the unknown African coast. He himself built a naval arsenal at Sagres on the southern promontory of Portugal, and here, when not busy with affairs of state, he would study the heavens, make charts, and watch anxiously for the returning sails of his brave adventurers. During Prince Henry's lifetime, Portuguese or Italians in his pay discovered not only Madeira, or the Island of Wood, as they christened it from its many forests, but the Canaries, Cape Verde Islands, and the African coast as far as south as Gambia and Sierra Leone. Soon there was no longer any need to bribe mariners into taking risks, for those who first led the way on these adventurous voyages brought back with them negroes and gold dust as evidence that they had been to lands where men could live and where there were possibilities of untold wealth. Thus, the work of exploration continued joyfully. It was in 1471, some years after the death of Prince Henry, that Portuguese navigators crossed the equator without being broiled black by the sun or raising sheets of flame, as the superstitious had predicted. The next important step on this new road to Asia was the voyage of Bartholomew Diaz, who, sailing ever southwards, swept in an icy wind without knowing it, round the Cape, past Table Mountain, and then, turning eastwards, landed at last on the little island of Santa Cruz in Algoa Bay, where he planted a cross. He would have explored the mainland also, but Kaffirs armed with heavy stones collected and drove back the landing party. Diaz, emboldened by his success, wished to sail farther, but his crew were weary of adventure, and with tears of regret in his eyes, he was forced to yield to their threats of mutiny and turn homewards. At Lisbon, describing his voyage, he said that on account of its dangers he had called the southernmost point of Africa the Cape of Storms. But the King of Portugal, hearing that this was indeed the limit of the continent, and that in all probability the way to Asia lay beyond, would not consent to such an ill omen name. It shall be the Cape of Good Hope, he declared, and so it has remained. In 1498, the work of exploration begun by Diaz was completed by another famous navigator, Vasco da Gama. National hopes of wealth and glory were centered on his task, and when he and his company marched forth to their ships, a large crowd went with them to the shore carrying candles and singing a solemn litany. Then the sails of his four vessels dipped below the horizon and were not seen for two years and eight months. But when at last men and women had begun to despair at the great silence, 
their hero reappeared amongst them, bringing news more wonderful and glorious than anything that Portugal had dared to hope. There is little space to tell in this chapter the adventures that Vasco da Gama related to the king and his court. He and his crews, it seemed, had sailed for weeks amid a lonely, dreary waste of seas and boundless sky. They had skirmished with Hottentots and doubled the Cape, caught in such a whirl of breakers and stormy winds that the walls of the wooden ships had oozed water, and despair and sickness had seized upon all. Vasco da Gama, even when ill and depressed, was not to be turned from his purpose. Eastwards and northwards he set his sails, in the teeth of laments and threats from his sailors, and so on Christmas Day landed on a part of the coast to which, in memory of this most famous Diaz Natalis, he gave the name of Natal. From Natal, battling the dread disease of scurvy brought on by prolonged diet of salt meat, the Portuguese commander pursued his way, attacked as often as he landed for water and fresh food by fierce Mohammedan tribes, until at last, guided by an Arabian pilot whom he had picked up, he came to the harbors of Calicut in India, where there was a Christian king. The new route to Asia had been discovered. A lucky venture, plenty of emeralds, you owe great thanks to God for having brought you to a country holding such riches, declared the natives and loud was the rejoicing of the Portuguese at this glorious national prospect. The likely effect of Vasco da Gama's voyage did not pass unnoticed elsewhere in Europe. Soon, exclaimed a Venetian merchant in deep gloom, it will be cheaper to buy goods in Lisbon than in Venice. The death knell of the great republic's commercial prosperity sounded in these words. In the meantime, some years before Vasco da Gama's triumphant achievement, a still greater discovery was made that was destined, in the course of time, to change the whole commercial aspect of the world. Its author was a Genoese sailor, Christopher Columbus, who, tradition says, once sailed as far north as Iceland and in the south to the island of Porto Santo. Always in his spare time, he could be found bent over maps and charts calculating, weaving round his reasoned mathematical arguments the tales of shipwrecked mariners, until at last he brought to the ears of his astonished fellow men and women a scheme for finding Cathay, neither by sailing south nor east, but due west across the Atlantic. Here is a 14th century description of the Atlantic, a dismal picture still popularly accepted in the 15th. Quote, a vast and boundless ocean on which ships dared not venture out of sight of land, for even if sailors knew the directions of the winds, they could not know whither those winds would carry them, and as there is no inhabited country beyond, they would run great risks of being lost in the mist and vapor. The limit of the west is the Atlantic Ocean. End quote. Many people still believe that the world was flat, and that to sail across the Atlantic was to incur the risk of being driven by the winds over the edge into space. Thus, Columbus met with either reproof for contemplating such risks, or ridicule for his folly. But so convinced was he of his own wisdom that he only grew the more enthusiastic as a result of opposition. Without money or royal patronage, he could not hope to make the voyage a success and so he laid his scheme before the king of Portugal, usually a willing patron of adventure. Unfortunately for Columbus, the discoveries along the African coast promised such wealth and trade to Portugal that her ruler did not feel inclined to take risks in other directions that, while they must involve expense, as yet held no guarantee of repayment. I went to take refuge in Portugal, wrote Columbus at a later date, since the king of that country was more versed in discovery than any other. But in fourteen years I could not make him understand what I said. Driven at last from Portugal by a decided refusal, Christopher went to Spain, sending his brother Bartholomew with a letter explaining his project to King Henry the Seventh of England. It is interesting to note that the keen-witted tutor, as soon as the scheme was laid before him, 
is said to have expressed his readiness to learn more and to lend his support but bartholomew had been shipwrecked on his voyage northward and owing to this delay columbus had already received the patronage of spain and set out on his voyage before his brother returned with the news it was queen isabel of castile wife of king ferdinand of aragon who after considerable hesitation and against the advice of a council of leading bishops and statesmen determined finally to pledge her sympathy and tradition says her jewels if necessary in the mariner's cause part of the attraction of this project lay in its appeal to her castilian imagination for castile had ever been haunted by the possibilities of the bleak gray ocean that ruled at the gates of galicia but still more potent than the thought of discovery was the desire of spreading the catholic faith this hope also inspired columbus who regarded his enterprise as in the nature of a crusade believing that he had been called to preach the gospel to the millions of heathen inhabiting cathay when columbus set forth on his first voyage to the indies as he roughly called the unknown territory he sought those who sailed in his three ships were many of them pressed men that is sailors ordered on board by their town that having incurred royal displeasure was given this way of appeasing it thus they were without enthusiasm or any belief in what they thought their admiral's mad and dangerous adventure and from the time that they lost sight of land they never ceased to grumble and utter threats of mutiny at one time it was the extraordinary variation in the compass that brought them trembling to complain at another the steadiness of the wind blowing from the east that they believed would never change and allow them to return home finally it was the sluggish waters of the sargassa sea amid whose weeds they saw themselves destined to drift until they died of starvation and thirst to every suggestion of setting the sails eastward columbus turned a deaf ear but for the rest he threatened cajoled or argued as the occasion seemed to demand his own heart sinking each time the cry of land was raised and ardently desired vision proved only to be some bank of clouds lying low upon the horizon at length came the news that a moving light had been seen in the darkness it appeared like a candle that went up and down says columbus in his diary and all waited eagerly for dawn that revealed at last a wooded island later called the bahamas but then believed to be a part of the mainland of asia clad in armor and carrying the royal banner of spain the great discoverer of the west stepped ashore and there humbly kneeling he and his crews raised to heaven a te deum of thankfulness and joy columbus made five voyages to the west in all for the way once shown proved easy enough nor did he need to press crews for the enterprise but rather to guard against unwelcome stowaways the brown-skinned indians gaily colored parrots gold nuggets and strange roots that he brought back as witness of his first success were enough to inflame the minds and ambitions of spaniards with such high hopes of wealth and glory that they almost fought to be allowed to join the expeditions vasco da gama was rewarded for his voyage to india with a large pension in the portuguese title of dom he died in honored old age it is sad to find that after the first triumphant return when no glory and praise seemed too great to bestow on their hero the spaniards turned against columbus they blamed him because gold was not more abundant because his settlers quarreled and started feuds with the natives because although a very great mariner he did not prove a governor able to control and manage other men easily not a few were jealous of his genius and determined to bring about his ruin out of spite from his third voyage to the west columbus was sent back by his enemies in chains ill with wounded pride at his shameful treatment queen isabel hearing of it instantly ordered his release and tried to soothe his indignation but not long afterwards she herself died and ferdinand left to himself was wholly intent on aragonese ambitions in the mediterranean to him the conquest of naples was far more important than any discovery of cathay 
and so Columbus's complaints went unheeded, and he died in poverty, forgotten by all save a few. After twenty years of toil and peril, he exclaimed bitterly, as he was borne ashore from his last voyage, I do not own even a roof in Spain. The new world to which he had won an entrance was given the name of another, namely of a Florentine, Amerigo Vespucci, who, sailing beyond the West Indies, reached the mainland. The effect of Columbus's discovery upon the life of Europe was momentous. No longer the Atlantic lay like a gray wall between man and the unknown. It had become a highway, not to Cathay, but to a greater west, where there were riches beyond all human dreaming, ready as a harvest for the enterprising and hard-working. The central road of medieval commerce had been the Mediterranean. The highway of the modern world was to be the Atlantic, and the commercial future of Europe lay not with the city republics of the south, but with the nations of the north and west, with Portugal and Spain, with Flanders and England, that had lain upon the fringe of the old world, but stood at the very heart of the new. End of chapter 22